Likuti Sichais, Chedek Chav Gimel, Volume 23, the second Sicha of Parsha Shlach. This Sicha will explain the purpose, the objective, in the punishments in the Torah for those who sin, but also that emphasizing the amazing connection that every single Yid has to Hashem, that even when they did sin, notwithstanding the fact that perhaps they did something against Hashem's will, yet they are one and connected to Hashem and stand to enjoy the Olam Haba, Tchiyas HaMesim, the resurrection of the dead. So as an introduction, first of all, it would be worthwhile to familiarize ourselves with the verses that are applicable in this Sicha, that is, in our Parsha, chapter 14, Perik Yudalad, from verse 11 through verse 16. Over there, in short, it says, Moshe Rabbeinu makes the argument to Hashem. When Hashem says that I am going to kill them all, I am going to put to death all those that complained against me, and those is referring to the men above the age of 20 in the count of 600,000. And Moshe argues to Hashem, and he says, well, if you're going to do so, then the Egyptians, I'm paraphrasing, the Egyptians who heard about your great strength and might, how you took them out of Mitzrayim, and now you're going to kill them all like one person, meaning in one shot, they're going to say, oh, Hashem does not have the ability to bring him into the land that he promised them, and therefore, by Yishchotem Bamidbar, I want you to to be familiar with these words, and he shechted them, he slaughtered them, usually shechita means ritually slaughtered them, in the desert. And Rashi explains that basically they'll say, look, Farah was just one king. So, okay, God had some ability to, to fight against him. Whereas in Eretz Yisrael, there's 31 kings, oh, that's why Hashem can't make it. And this actually changed, so to speak, Hashem's mind, and Hashem said, okay, they won't die all at once, but rather they'll stay here and it'll be over time, a period of 40 years. So that's one thing to be familiar with. Another thing, the, a rule in Rashi. We know that Rashi, what is his commentary? His commentary is purely answers to questions or to uh, issues that arise as one is learning. Pshutei shel mikra. The simple, basic meaning of the verses. Now, if Rashi doesn't address something, that means there is no question, or that even if there is a question that perhaps can arise, but it is, could be very easily and very simply answered, either by looking a little closer and examining the words better, or perhaps by something that Rashi had said previously. And... But if Rashi doesn't say anything, that means either, again, it's not a question or it's easily answered. Another thing to familiarize ourselves with, the concept of shechita. We know when an animal, in order for it to be eaten, it has to be shechted, it has to be slaughtered. What is the idea of shechita? So we know the Chachamim tell us in the Gemara that when it says in the Torah, v'shachat, say the Chachamim, ein v'shachat elo v'moshach, that the word v'shachat means to be moishech, to draw. That means when you shecht an animal, it's not merely killing it, it's not just to take its life, but rather to draw it, to elevate it, take it, so to speak, bring it up to Kedusha. Another thing to be familiar with, the idea of a bris, a covenant. We know, for example, by Matan Torah, when Hashem gave us the Torah, that was the ultimate covenant that we made with us. What is the idea of a covenant? So it's brought down, the al talks about it in Likuti Torah, that this is the parable is that two very, very dear, good friends that they know that, listen, one day down the road, something could arise. Something can come up that perhaps can hamper, could in, in, interfere with their love for one another. So what do they do? They make a covenant, which basically says, which basically establishes that no matter what happens down the road, they are like one. They stay together. They are going to love each other. They're going to be loyal to each other. Now, finally, another thing to familiarize ourselves with in the Gemara Sanhedrin, in, on, in the Mishnah actually, on Daf Kuf Ches Amad Aleph, 108, side 1, it says over there in the Mishnah that the Meraglim, the, the, the spies from this week's Parsha, have no chilek, have no share in the world to come. Why? Because it says twice by them, by Yamusu, and they died. So that infers, according to the Tana, that they died, they died, meaning they died in this world, they died in the world to come. 
In fact, this Tana also holds that not only the Meraglim, but the entire generation, all the men that cried, all of them will not merit for Elam Haba. However, Rabbi Lezer says, he argues and he says, no, the generation of the desert, meaning the people, the 600,000 men, they do have a part in Elam Haba. And he even brings, learns it out from a verse in Tehillim. In chapter 50, capital Nun, Pasuk Hay, verse 5. Where it says over there, Isfuli Hasidoi Kursi Brisiel Izabach. Hashem says over there, and this is a reference metaphorically to the time, the end of time in Ulam Haba, when Bitchis Amesim it says, Gather all my righteous ones, those who made the covenant with me over the offerings, over the sacrifices. Now we know what this is referring to is obviously to the time of Matan Toida when Hashem made a covenant with us. And there were very specific offerings that were offered as a result or a connection to this. One more thing, the final introduction, machlekes between Bavli and or Nigla and Agada or Zoyar. That means whenever there seems to be a dispute between the Gemara, between what we call the revealed part of the Torah, typically the Talmudical, uh, uh, the, the Babylonian Talmud, and Agada, which is like Medrash, or even deeper, let's say, Zoyar Kabbalah, then the, typically the halacha is, it stands like the agoda or like the Kabbalah. Let's go into the Sikha. So as discussed many times, Rashi only addresses matters that are difficult, that require explanation. Even when there is a question that Rashi doesn't know the answer to, Rashi will say, I don't know. I don't know how to explain this. Which basically is saying, look, there's a question here, but I don't know how to explain it. And therefore... When Rashi doesn't address something, when Rashi doesn't say anything, that in itself is proof, that in itself is evidence that there is no question, or even if there seems to be a question, it can be very easily answered. Now in our Parsha, when Hashem says to Moshe, I'm going to kill them all, I'm going to annihilate them, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. What did Moshe argue to Hashem? His argument, as we said in the introduction, Oh, the Egyptians are going to hear this and they're going to say, wow, Hashem is not able to bring him into the land and therefore, he slaughtered them in the desert. Now, if you think about it, this seems to be totally not understandable. You see, the actual killing, in other words, for the actual fact that Hashem wants to destroy them all, that Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't seem to have a big issue with. He doesn't take issue with that. Well, consider, these are so many people, 600,000 men. They're not just people, they're, they're, they're Yidin. They're the children of Hashem. And Moshe, who's the one who took them out of Mitzrayim and spent all that time and made all the, and, and, and de- dedicated to them and doing all these miracles, and Moshe doesn't say anything about it. What is he really, what is his argument? What is his, so to speak, worry? What is his concern? That what are the Goyim going to say? Why didn't you just say, how can you do it? How can you kill so many people at once? That should have been the cry. That should have been the argument. But it's not. The argument is, and this seems to be, have been compelling enough that Hashem, so to speak, changed his mind. Why? What's going to be what the Goyim say about it? For that seems to have been the thing that shaked, shook him up so much. So the Rebbe says we'll understand this by taking a closer look at the actual words at the expressions that Moshe used. If you look in the Pasuk at the end, he says, Vayishchotim Bamidbar. And he shechted them in the desert. Now, this is not a typical way of describing annihilation of people. Usually, Shechita is used in reference to animals. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu using this particular expression when it comes to killing the people? In fact, if you look earlier in his words, Moshe himself used the words, Vehemata, Sa'amazah, and you're going to kill them, which is appropriate, apropos, to, to human beings. The explanation is that by using the word Vayishchotim, we get an appreciation and understanding that Moshe was not arguing against the fact that Hashem wants to kill them. That he understood. Because even a child learning Chumash on a very basic elementary level understands that the idea of Shechita is not merely to kill, to take life, 
But rather, as we said in the introduction, shechita is an idea of elevating something. We find it, for example, Abraham Avinu was told, bring Yitzchak v'ha'aleyu sham la'ila, and bring him up for an oila. And what did Abraham understand? That the only way to do so is to shecht him. She never said to shecht him. It says v'ha'aleyu, bring him up. Well, that's the only way to bring him up is by shechting. What, what is the idea? What is the explanation? What does it mean that by shechting them, it would be elevating them? And Moshe, even Moshe was agreeable to that, so to speak, or could understand it, could tolerate it. You see, we understand, it's known and it's obvious that Hashem is the ultimate compassionate one. And therefore, all the mitzvahs that Hashem gave us is all for our benefit. Meaning that when you go and follow in Hashem's ways, then you have a purposeful life then you live a life that's worth that's worth living. Not only spiritually, but even Begashmias. Hashem says, in If you're going to go on my ways, I'm going to give you your Gashmias. So, what happens, Chas Shalom? When we transgress, we go against Hashem's commandments, and there is a punishment. What is the idea of the punishment? What does it mean that Hashem gives us a punishment? And sometimes it can be a severe punishment of the taking of one's life. This is not to take revenge from the person or to hurt the person, to give him pain, to inflict, so to speak, pain on him as a vendetta because you went against Hashem's will, but rather because Hashem is all compassionate, this is to help the person. This is for the benefit of the person. Meaning, because the person didn't go, follow in Hashem's ways, if he continues to live, then his life is not going to be worth living. He's not going to have a peaceful life. He's not going to have a happy life. It's not going to be a good life. In fact, sometimes a person can be alive, but they are, they are totally disgusted by their own life. They're totally uncomfortable with their own existence. Therefore, Hashem directs us to take the person's life in this world so he shouldn't have to suffer through a life in this world which is not a happy life, which is not a good life, which is not a comfortable life. Now, where do we see such a concept that sometimes Hashem says to take a person's life earlier in order for them not to suffer in this world? We actually have a precedent for that. Remember that Abraham Avinu passed away five years prior to his destined uh, day of passing. And what was the reason for that? So it says because Hashem did not want him to see and to endure the uh, pain, uh, to, to endure the pain of seeing his grandson Esau turn out the way he turned out. And therefore, Hashem took his life five years early. So you see this idea of taking one's life is not necessarily a punishment. It can actually be for the purpose and favor so they don't have to live a life of suffering. Now, of course, in this case, there's even more that not only they don't have to live a life of suffering, but because they have this, what we call punishment, for lack of a better word, and therefore the life was taken, they suffered through that punishment. Therefore, now, not only they don't have to endure a difficult, challenging life and a meaningless life in this world, but now they are zoicha to Olam Haba. In other words, the bottom line is it is in his best interest and his his own good, his own his own favor for the person to get the punishment. And uh, therefore we can understand it over here. When they sinned with the ego, for example, when they sinned with the golden calf, over there Moshe did challenge the fact that Hashem wants to kill him. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu said, give them a chance to do tshuva. In other words, the whole purpose of taking their life is that what? They shouldn't have to live through and endure a difficult, challenging, meaningless life. Give them a chance to make meaning in their life. Give them a chance to do tshuva. But when it came here, as Hashem himself said, that Ad yinat like, how much will they already go against me? In other words, this is a continuous thing. This is not a one-time thing. By the Egel, it was the first time they ever sinned. But here it has been many, many, many times. This was a culmination of sins going against Hashem. Moreover, this wasn't just any sin. This was a sin of a, a fundamental challenge of Emuna that they didn't believe in Hashem, that they had lack of, of faith in Hashem after everything that was done for them. And therefore, it's understood that in such a situation, in such a circumstance, Moshe Rabbeinu is not asking for them to be spared. Because actually, there's no other way out. In other words, even Moshe Rabbeinu understood that perhaps they need to be killed. They need to be, their lives need to be taken because there's no, so to speak, there's no coming back from this. There's no remedy from this. At least it didn't seem that there would be a remedy from this. And therefore, Moshe says, 
In other words, he agrees with this. He agrees with the concept that it will have the effect of shechita, that it will elevate them, will take them out of the current situation that they're in, and elevate them, bring them, transport them to a higher place. However, Moshe Rabbeinu's argument was, since, what is the whole sin? What was the sin of the Meraglim? How would you sum it up? As we just said, a lack of faith, that they fundamentally did not believe in Hashem. They didn't trust in Hashem. So therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu asked, how could we, how could you, Hashem, kill them in all in one shot, that this will lead them, this will lead to actually a more lack of faith. Because remember, even a guy has to have a Buna in Hashem. Even a guy has to have a favor, has to have faith in Hashem. Not only a Yid, a Yid has to have more. But also a guy, every human being has to have faith in Hashem. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu argued, when you're going to kill them all at once, this is going to trigger a lack of faith also amongst the Goyim, also amongst the Egyptians and the other Goyim. And therefore, this is not going to accomplish anything. Rather, it's going to bring to more lack of emunah. And that was his, that was his argument. Now, the question still is, wait one second. In the narrative that Moshe is saying, in the words of Moshe, when he says the words by Yishchatim by Midbo that he was Shechtim in the desert, whose words were these supposed to be, so to speak? This would have been the Goyim's words that the Goyim will say because Hashem cannot, does not have the ability, it's not the strength to bring him into their land, therefore by Yishchatim by Midbo. Wait, if the Goyim would use this term by Yishchatim, that means the Goyim would be appreciative of the fact that this is a benefit for them, that this is not out of lack of ability to bring him into Eretz Yisrael. So how come Moshe is arguing that the Goyim will say that? The answer is in the word Bamidbar, in the desert. Why did Moshe add the word the desert? Yes, you killed them. Obviously in the desert before he brought them into Israel. Why does he have to emphasize this? Why did he have to underscore the fact that Hashem will kill them all in the desert? This would make the Goyim think so. The answer is, if that means even the Goyim would understand that if the sole objective would have been just to Vayishchatim, to elevate them, to kill them, but to elevate them back to a good place where they can be zoichel oilam haba, where they can be wiped away from the sin and not have to continue and endure a life of meaning, meaningless, a meaningless life, a life of painfulness, of pain, a life, a life of pain and suffering, for that would have been enough by Yishchatim, that he should shecht them. But where? Well, the guy would understand first, one second, Hashem has an oath that he, that he himself took. He swore that they're going to go into Eretz Yisrael. So the guy would have understood, let Hashem take him into Eretz Yisrael. So Hashem fulfilled his promise. Then he should, and then he will shech them. That the guy would understand. The guy also appreciates the idea of Ayishchatim, that shechting is to elevate the person. However, if you would be Vayishchatim Bamidbar, says Moshe, you're going to shech them right here, right now in the desert. Then the Goyim will say, wait, maybe this is not an Indian of Shechita. Maybe this is not because, or it's not solely because, exclusively because Hashem wants to benefit them and give them the benefit and elevate them back after going so far and straying with such a terrible sin. They'll say, well, if it's in the desert, maybe that's because Hashem doesn't even have the ability to bring him into Eretz Yisrael. And this was a compelling argument. And in fact, the way Hashem did it was in a way that even the Goyim would understand the idea by Yishchatim, but not by Midbar. They died over the course of 40 years, which was a slow thing. It wasn't a sudden thing, which almost looks like, you know, like a hasty decision where one cannot, you know, accomplish something. So one has to quickly jump to plan B. And according to all of this that we discussed, the idea of Ayishchatim, we can now appreciate the Gemara, the Mishnah in Sanhedrin, that over there the Tanakhama says that a Dor Hamidbar does not have a Chedek Leilam and especially the Miraglim. However, we hold that Dor Hamidbar Boyim Leilam Haba, they come to Leilam Haba, and that means that they will, they will resurrect and come back into a guf gashmi, into a physical body, in Vaitchiyas HaMesim. And this is something that's understood in the Zoyar and the Midrashim. That what is the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu was not Zoyche to go to Eretz Yisrael? Not only was he not Zoyche to go to Eretz Yisrael, but he wasn't Zoyche, he didn't merit to go to Eretz Yisrael, even, even posthumously, even to be buried in Eretz Yisrael. 
Why? Because he had to stay there, says the Zohar, with the people that he took out of Mitzrayim and be there all these thousands of years until Tchia Sameisim. So he can continue and finish the job and lead them into Eretz Yisrael, which means that they will get up with Tchia Sameisim according to the Zohar. Now, notwithstanding in the fact that in the Mishnah it says, like I said, that the generation of the, of the Midbar, meaning the people who complained, the 600,000 men are not going to go into Eretz Yisrael, but remember, that is an opinion of the Talmud Bavli, of Nigla the Teira. But the rule is, as we said in the introduction, that when the Zoyar has a differing opinion, or even the Medrash, the Agada, then the Halach is like the Zoyar, the Agada. And moreover, in this particular case, it's not only relying on this rule, but in fact, in the Gemara itself, it comes out that the Halach is like Rabbi Eliezer, who argues with the Tanakhama, and he says that they do have a Chilik Lomab. Says the Rebbe now a big, big Chiddush. The Rebbe adds to this and says, according to everything that we've said above, in the idea of Aishchatim, when Hashem punishes a person and takes their life, it's not a negative, but rather it's the ultimate positive. It's a union of Shechita, it's elevating them. We could understand from this that also the Meraglim themselves, the spies themselves, are also going to have a Chilik Leilam Haba. And again, notwithstanding, the fact that it says clearly that they don't have, it says in the Mishnah. But remember the Pasuk, the verse that Abeliezer brings, which is a reference to the covenant that they made by Matan Taita, the Miraglim were also part of that. The Miraglim were part of that covenant. And Bemele says the Rebbe, now that we know that Hashem punished them, and they says, Vayemusu, and they, they died in a terrible death. But the fact is that they were killed for this sin. They were put to death for this sin, means that they were shechted, means that they're going to get up for Elam Haba, even the Miraglim. Now, even though it's a very terrible, severe sin, well, we know that what is the idea of a covenant? Being that we're relying on the covenant, as the al Rebbe says, that when you have a covenant, these two people that enter the covenant, they become so connected to each other, nasu kibasar echa, they become like one flesh, it becomes like one body. Now, even if somebody, let's say your right hand does something terrible, your left hand is not going to chop it off because it did something terrible. It's still part of the same body. It hurts. It's painful. It's not pleasant. But it's still part of the same thing. Says the Rebbe, from all of this, we have a wonderful lesson, a wonderful directive. That when we see another Yid, and perhaps that Yid seems to be on such a low level, such a terrible, and such a terrible behavioral mode, that they even seem, they even appear to be like the Miraglim, who went against Hashem on such a fundamental level. Still, we have to look on that Yid, see in that Yid, not the way the Yid's behaving, but look deeper and see the covenant that the Yid belongs to. See the fact that this Yid was also one of the Yidin that stood by Matan Torah and is part of Hashem's covenant. And there, all we need to do is to try to make the effort to do our part to bring that into the open. But not chas v'sholem to shun that yid or to look at the yid as any less. And this, of course, will bring to the ultimate time when there'll be total revelation of godliness in the world where everybody will have revealed an obvious emunah.